someone asked me the other day, what's your word of the year? I hadn't thought of it and I just sputtered out, relax. Intimacy and connection are built into the human psyche and while an AI can probably replicate that and will try, it's not going to be the same as human to human. Intimacy is going to be the premium in terms of being able to connect with your customers. All of us are in pursuit of more freedom, more success. I would really encourage people to take stock in what their core values are and structure their life in such a way that those values remain priority. Most of you will find that money is not as high up on the list as you think it is. Welcome back, everybody. We are back for another amazing episode of Flipping the Lid. And you know by now what we do. We jump into the real raw conversations of what has shaped people's lives, their success. And we feature some of the most significant, successful people who are creating impact in this world. Today, we have someone who is no different. She is a mom of four, multiple multi-million business owner, and one of the digital marketing queens that's helping so many other entrepreneurs be able to put themselves in a position to be able to scale to a minimum of 2 million and beyond. She has been working with some of the top of the top in the world and been featured on shows to demonstrate her expertise all the way across the board with people like Rachel Ray and some of the biggest digital marketing platforms on the planet. But what I really am excited about with this individual is her heart, the way that she moves through the world and the way that she connects with people. It's so real. It's so raw. It's so genuine. And Julie, I am so excited to jump in today. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. I love it. Well, the only question that I ask every single one of our guests is almost always the first question after the intro. Okay. I just gave a description based on who you are in my experience of you and the, the little bit that I know about you in the few months that we've known each other. But who are you in your words? I, you know, it's funny. You were uh, introducing me and I'm sure lots of guests feel this way. Like, wait, no, 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 that's not <laughs> me. Like <laughs> I'm a, a train wreck of a human being trying to manage business and children and teenagers and love and life. And so I don't think I would ever describe myself the way you just did. Uh, of course I you think wouldn't. That's, I think that's true for a lot of us, right? <laughs> yeah, I, of course you wouldn't. And, I, and I, I would say the same thing. I mean, whether somebody reads one of my written bios or they freestyle one like I just did, it's sometimes difficult to see ourselves the way other people see us. And yes. I think even what you right. just said, what's, which is what I wrapped the whole intro with, is just your heart, how real and raw you are. And for you to just immediately lean in and show vulnerability, you're like, I'm a train wreck of a human being. <laughs> Guess what? That means you're a fucking human being. Because yeah. we all are in some form and fashion. We all have elements that are not perfect. And that's part of the reason for this show is to normalize the discussions on the things that aren't normally talked about, right? I yeah. give the highlight reel quickly and easily for people to understand your credibility and elements of who you are. But what you'll notice through our conversation is I want them to get to know who you are, not what you do, right? Yeah. What you do will feature at the end. They'll have access to you because you're brilliant. And I want everybody in our world to know you. But who you are is the most important thing. And so I just wanted to honor even the way you answered that question, because it just leaned right into everything I believe about you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you. I would like to know, just to start off leaning into some of the words that you just used, what does it mean to you to be a train wreck of a human being? It's so I think it, it, it always feels like I'm just barely making it because hey. when it comes to balance, there's always something on fire, whether I've opened my phone and I've see that we've got, you know, policies I got to change in the company, or I'm at a doctor's appointment with my teenager who's struggling, or I've got my younger kid who, you know, the, the, the principal's like, you know, your kid, you know, had a scuffle in the playground. It's, I mean, for myself with four children and, you know, I'm divorced. So I have exes in the picture and two businesses and business partners and lots of customers, it always feels like at the end of the day, if I'm not really, really intentional about honoring what I accomplished, I will just look at everything that's a mess and I will be like, oh my gosh, like how is this all still working? Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of you know parents can relate if they're parents and business owners. Oh yeah. It's just, it's, it's a juggle. You know, it's something my wife and I talk about often. She's she's my business partner, my partner in life. She runs, she's our COO. So she runs a whole lot of elements with some of our programs and the back end elements of our business. And, you know, it's it's fascinating because we both 
are very involved, very intentional parrots, right? And I would tell you that we do life together, right? So that means all of the things that you just described. And the factor that we can leverage and understand is that we're doing it together as a partnership and everything. Whereas even what you just identified being, you know, a single parent, whether you're having shared custody or not, there is a lot more responsibility that falls on you on top of being a business owner. And I'll tell you 2023 for us, there was this moment of like surrender and acceptance that it's like life is just about existing in the chaos and still being able to be grounded and okay. Right. Because it's, it doesn't ever stop. It doesn't yeah. ever change. And every moment that you think that something is going smooth, all of a sudden you turn around and something else is like, wait, what? How did this, where did this come from? What you said, and I want to, I want to pause just a little bit because I want to, I want to be really clear when I ask this, when I say this question and make this comment, I am not in any way implying that this is necessarily true for you. However, words that you said in the very beginning reminded me of one of my favorite quotes. Do you know uh, Alex Sharfin? Yes, Have you ever met course. him? Okay. So, oh, yeah. Alex Sharfin, I, I quote him on this often, but you know, you said it's like, yeah, I'm constantly going back and forth to put out the next fire. And he says, if you're constantly putting out fires in your life and your business, there's a good chance you're the arsonist. <laughs> yeah. Right? Now, I've always said that everything begins and ends with us. But as you hear that quote from someone that you and I both know, I mean, how does that resonate for you? And, and what do you identify with, if anything, within that statement? I think some of it I definitely identify with when it comes to things happening at home, right? I'm obviously the leader of my home. I have three children who are in their teen years. I chuckle when I see people who have young children who think they have parenting all figured out. I'm like, (laughs) wait. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, So I, I definitely see that playing out sometimes when there's just hair on fire issues. And I'm like, well, what's my responsibility here in in how that was created? I think with the business, I think that it's less me, the arsonist. I think it's just the volume of transactions, of employees, of customers at this point that statistics say somebody's going to be pissed when I open up my phone, you know, (laughs) like it's just just math. Um, And so it's not really, I, I don't think hair on fire is really the accurate issue as much as it's just the chance of someone being upset about something is high. Mm -hmm. And so there's always that sort of, you know, the customer service team saying, hey, how do we handle this? And then my HR saying, hey, this policy just updated in California. What do we do about this? And it's just the it's just the amount of decisions that I have to make in a day because of the people, you know, that are reporting to me. That's more how it feels on the business side. I, I mean, I fully accept that answer. That's why I say I, mean, I wasn't trying to pigeonhole you or put you into any bucket there. But but when you said those words, I was like, man, Alex's voice just jumped into my head. And I was like, I got to bring this into the conversation. He's, he's, awesome. he's, an, he's an incredible human being. I mean, just unbelievable heart. And, you know, I think his his focus and alignment, at least in the way that I believe nervous system being such an important focus yes. for all entrepreneurs. I love that he's been normalizing that over the last few years. So Well, and that's, I mean, I, it's funny because when I was in my 20s, you know, I wasn't a business owner. And I remember everyone saying, oh, when you get to your 40s, you won't care. You know, you'll just be free spirit. And I've had the opposite experience. I was way braver, way bolder, way more feeling invincible. And the older I've gotten, the more um, my nervous system is like, can't handle like, yeah. all of the like input. And I've gotten more private and a little bit more hesitant and a little bit more careful as I've aged. And I think also as my responsibility has increased, I'm still waiting for that moment when I have that like, I don't give a fuck anymore. <laughs> and yeah. like, it hasn't happened. <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking of that, though, I think that even how you just talked about that, it's like I've been a little bit more reserved. I pull back a little bit more. I'm, I'm a little more cautious in certain things. I mean, that brings me right to our very first interaction. Yeah. Right. I mean, we, yeah. we met through a mutual friend, Steve Sims, at one of his um, uh, uh, speakeasies. Right. I yeah. mean, we were there, we were sitting and we were having this place. And I, I think, you know, hopefully I, I don't expose or say anything that's, um, you know, too personal and I won't. But one of the things that I remember vividly and and is how powerful your energy is, how clearly and how palpable I could feel and sense your heart. But I also remember the level of protection that you were existing in, at least in the first part of that experience. Yeah. Do you mind recapping or recounting your recollection of that interaction and kind of take us to where you were in that moment and what you saw yourself be able to evolve through over the course of even just a couple of days? 
Yeah. So we were at the speakeasy in Dallas in February, and that was a very disruptive uh, moment in my life. Business wise, I was having to make some tough decisions where, you know, the business had grown to the point where people were, I don't know how to say it, but ankle biters, you know, looking for Mm -hmm. equity and looking for and there was a little bit of like holding me over a barrel. So I had Mm -hmm. a very reserved protective stance going into that. Yeah. And I was, you know, I was a little reserved about even Steve, you know, I didn't really know him. He wasn't Mm -hmm. my typical cup of tea. I had no, I I came and I didn't know anybody. And I actually had had an interaction that morning where someone had said something to me that like kind of hurt my feelings. Mm. So I was in that room in a very, in a very protective stance. So I remember that evening going to that uh, bar place we were hanging out. Yeah, the hidden, hidden hideout. That yeah. hidden thing that we were in. Mm-hmm. It was so dark. And I remember sitting down next to you and I had the same, I had the same intuition about you and your energy. And I, um, and so I think the, probably the most poignant conversation of the two days was that conversation with you on the couch. And, you know, you, you called me out pretty fast and I was like, oh yeah, he's, he is as intuitive as I sensed, you know, and you sensed the same as me. And Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, your, your comments to me really spoke to me. So I think the next day I made a very intentional effort to try to shed some of that protectiveness and show who I really was. And, um, and, and I think it made a difference for sure. Well, I, I'll tell you from an outsider's perspective, witnessing it. I mean, I feel like the way the room received you, the remaining part of that experience was completely different, right? It was like, yeah. there was like this attraction to you. You had this magnetism about you, which is what I had sensed, but I could tell it was being blocked. Right. And so that's why I, I just, I, I mean, this is one of the things I do, as you know, I sense and feel people's pain. I see and where yeah. the, and how they're protecting themselves. And I'm like, I want to pull them into their potential as quickly as I can. And so I really appreciate you recounting that, but why I went there was in specific nature of what you talked about, about how in your early 20s, you were way more bold, you were way more brave, you were way more just everything in the way that you were approaching it. And as life has gone on, to your point, your nervous system has kind of started to get a little bit more fried. And and as a result, we start to shut ourselves down a little bit. Could you give a little bit of context into the progression between your 20s and your current state that you believe contributed to some of the nervous system hits and some of maybe the conscious, right? Conscious pullback yep. in certain ways in your world. Yes, I can absolutely tell you that. So I, you know, I think in my twenties, I think there is that curse of genius that happens that the more, you know, the more you realize you don't know. And so when you're younger, you, you think, you know, everything, right? So you have that sort of confidence. I think some of that was in play. I think there was a definite shift when I hit it big, if you will, when my audience exploded, because all of a sudden I was dealing with haters that were dredging up stuff from my past. And as my children started to get older and then they started looking at social media and all of a sudden I couldn't just get on Instagram and say, hey, you know, this is what's happening without knowing that it was like my teenagers, my ex-husband and you know the 17 haters over here who are trying to burn me at the stake and so all of a sudden you get this you get this stage fright almost of like okay how is this going to come back to bite me but i think the biggest thing that happened to me which was uh like a black swan event was that i had been working with a a a provider like a therapist for three Mm -hmm. years and um He tried to extort me actually one month after this speakeasy. And I think I was already in a protective mode from various things. And then that next month, I, I'll never forget it. I was in in an interview just like this one, but there were like, it was like a panel and I wasn't speaking and I made the terrible mistake of seeing the little notification come up that I had an email and I looked down at my phone. It was like all caps for Julie's eyes only and like red siren like emojis. And I clicked on it. And basically it said, if you don't wire $50,000 to me by 5 p.m. today, I will tell all of your private clients everything oh my goodness. that I know from your therapy. 
It gets better though, Brian. This because... just happened like right out. I mean, this happened the month yes. after I met you. Yes. Oh yes. my goodness. Yes. So it was like March 10th. And I think we were at the speakeasy at the end of February. Yeah. So of course the police got involved and, you know, it was this whole thing. I called his bluff because I was like, this is illegal. Like <laughs> this is a, a felony offense. Yeah. Um, I obviously didn't wire him the money. Yeah. But one of the most terribly painful parts about this whole thing mm. was that he was I had I had decided to let him serve my son uh in a in in a therapeutic relationship. Mm. And so that relationship between my son got really damaged because I realized he had broken confidence mm. with my son in an attempt to orchestrate this whole thing. And so the fear that I already had going in like yeah. in February, there was clearly an intuition I had that like I'm exposed yeah. and that next month I had, you know, the rug pulled and I've been trying to recover from that for the last year. I just, I'm, all, I'm almost speechless, which if you know me at all, you know, that's not common for me. Um, first and foremost, I want to say thank you for, being so willing to share that, right? Mm -hmm. As recent as it really is. I mean, it's less than 12 months ago, right? Yeah. It, I'm sure that there's still elements and ramifications that are existing as a result of that. Absolutely. And it, what, well, yeah. it breaks my heart. Um, when people are in a position to be able to hold a safe and protected space for others and they gain the trust to allow someone to share the depths of their soul in an attempt for that person to improve themselves. Right. Right. And then that same information is used against them. Yeah. All it does is reinforce the armor, the protection mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the lack of trust in, I'm going to say humanity, right? Because you're literally compensating even somebody that is supposed to be this role for you outside of any other fo formal or informal relationship. And then they, whole something like that and then having your kid involved is a whole nother level um, yeah it, it's like those movies where you know they're you're running from the bad guy and you go to the cops you, you, yeah. know, you go to the, the and then they're the bad guys yeah that, that level of like it's literally yeah and that's you know it's it's one thing when you know you tell a secret to a friend and they tell somebody else and it you, you know makes its way down the you know the telephone line but this because this was what i considered a very private you know it's like attorney client privilege but yeah, in, in the world of therapy yeah um it was it, my nervous system was like okay of course it was done. <laughs> of course it was yeah i mean here's the thing yeah. i mean I, I i live in a world of confidentiality right like the work yeah. i do if i can't maintain confidence then i don't have right. clients right it's it's something that i will not sacrifice i don't go down that path and I don't take that lightly just because I know how sensitive this can be. And oh, by the way, things like that can also perpetuate and create a compound effect of damage, right? That's right. just hitting on all the things that you were going to see this person to help with anyway. Now it's I amplified, the irony. right? Like the I mean, irony. But, but that's, that's exactly it. And so if, if you don't mind, I kind of want to hold you in this space for just a second. And I'm, I'm really curious, right? Mm -hmm. And this, I, I'm asking this question as much as an interview as I, as I am as a friend because I genuinely care. And I, I'm sorry that you went through that experience. Less than a year later, how has that interaction affected other relationships in your life? And this desire and tendency that your nervous system is telling you and this need to protect yourself, how has that either been reinforced or what lessons have you extracted from this experience to start to work through that further? Yeah. So I think the single greatest consequence is that it causes me to doubt my own perception of reality. Mm. And mm. that's the scariest part. That's the scariest consequence is like, if I can't trust my intuition yeah. about somebody, uh, I've got, I don't, I don't have anything. Yeah. It's like, so that has been the biggest consequence. Now I went through a divorce at the beginning of t 2022. Okay. Uh, I, I believe that I, Oh my gosh, now I'm confused. Did I was it the beginning of 2023 that this yes, okay. Yeah. So yeah, you and I met at the beginning of 2023. 23, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I had gone through a divorce in 2022. And so in 2023, 
I was starting a new relationship and that sort of intuition fear came up significantly. Mm-hmm. I also felt it in with my children, like, do I trust what you're saying? Um, can I believe you? You know, yeah. teenagers also like to lie, you know, yeah. and so they were doing their own fair share of lying. So I was like, do I believe anybody about anything yeah. anywhere? And, you know, I think there were several people in my world that I felt safe enough with that I continued. It, it didn't impact that, but it did impact business, children, love relationships, all of them across the board. And it's it still plays out a little bit to this day. So if you're willing to stay here just a little bit longer, could you give some examples of the impacts within your business and some of the other areas that, and again, you don't have to get super granular on this, but Mm -hmm. why am I asking the question? Because I want people to be able to understand the connection between the things that we consistently are dealing with and its ripple effect throughout our lives and businesses. And so again, you don't get as granular as you're comfortable getting, but if you can give one or two examples on the impacts of this singular thing where you were on an effort to heal yourself, remove the protection and what it caused as a result of it, And then I promise you after this, we'll shift off of this topic and go somewhere else. Yeah, I, you know, so, okay. So I had a situation where someone was asking for like a a larger role in my company okay, because they were bringing something to the table that they felt like they had. And I was feeling insecure about if I had what it took to do to grow what I wanted to grow. And so when they came in with this offer, there was part of me that felt a little sideswiped because it felt like uh, I'm either going to do this or I'm or we're not going to work together. That's what it it felt like sort of a, a do or die moment. And I felt really insecure about my ability to assess if this was a good move or not. Um so I don't know if this actually helped because my paranoia that had kind of been triggered by this whole thing felt like I couldn't really trust people's yeah. word. Yeah. So in in these situations that followed, and this was just one, I, and, I, and it's weird that this is the problem. It gets reinforced. I took that same. I took that same route. I don't think I can really trust that yeah. what they're saying is accurate. And it, and I was correct. Mm-hmm. So I, I basically said, you know what? I think I'm going to do this myself. Thanks so much. And it was kind of like said to me, oh, well, good luck trying to do it yourself. You know, there was a little bit of that. I mean, not not too bad. Um, but I believed that I could do it. And I believed that what they were saying wasn't really accurate, uh, which is kind of a confirmation of paranoia a little bit which i don't like because i hate the feeling of being paranoid but that decision ended up actually really helping our company grow yeah um and so i walk away from that and this is what happens like when i go to legal experts or i go and if if i go and then the person that i'm hiring to be the expert i start to doubt whether or not they're an expert i hate that feeling because i don't want to be the smartest person in the room yeah (laughs) I want someone to be like, oh, okay. But I am regularly finding out that I'm the smartest person in the room, not because I'm so much more intelligent, but just because I am going to be the best person to decide what's in my own best interest. And it's scary to trust myself more than it is to trust other people. I just want everyone else to be right and then I can trust them. I don't want to have to trust myself, you know? It's a weird feeling. It is a weird feeling. However, it's, it is interesting because I think to your whole point, you had intuition in February, right? That something yeah. was off. Um, mm-hmm. I did. You, it, it makes you question who you can trust up to and including your own judgment. And then <laughs> exactly. you're given another opportunity before too long where it doesn't feel right. And oh, by the way, it could be muddied waters because some people have no ability to separate between what had would have just happened to you and now what you're being faced with. And what? yet you were confirmed that your intuition in this case was also correct. And so it is interesting because it's like you even are articulating. I wish I could just trust everyone else. But it seems to me like every time you actually honor and trust you, it only reinforces the trust that you have in you. 
I know. And I don't know why it's so scary to bet on myself. And I find this yeah. all the time when I'm teaching students. They're like, they want to throw money at me mm-hmm. and trust me and my expertise. And I'm like, we the, the biggest bet you're going to have to make is on yourself. And yeah. that's a hard, it's a hard one to make. It is a hard one to make. But I also want to say, so I'm, I, I say this with no expectation. You know me well enough by now to know this. I know that when you and I had met maybe two months after the speakeasy, I had left you with a comment that just said, Julie, like, I know I can help you. Right. Yeah. I know that I can help you. Now, I want to be really clear. Given everything that took place, if I were you, I also would have not leaned into anybody who would have said that to me in at any point in the near future. And so, again, there's still zero expectation to this, but I'll just drop it right here because, my friend, like it is possible. It is possible for you to live in your 40s free, fulfilled with joy and to be able to still respond to those things. And so as your friend alongside you, I just want you to know there's someone here rooting for you who, you. whether it's formal or informal, I will help you however I can because I believe in you and I trust that your heart, your intentions, and your intuition are solid. And I knew that the second I met you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. You're welcome, my friend. Um, all right. So I was hoping you were going to be wearing a hoodie today because you uh, told me that you love wearing hoodies. I do. And then I was like, I have an interview. I don't know if it's video. Maybe I should wear a button down instead of a hoodie. <laughs> Weird. You didn't trust yourself, did you? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh tell me your love and affinity for hoodies i i make so many decisions i really ascribe mm-hmm. to the steve jobs or whoever came up with the idea decision the same, yeah yeah mm-hmm. the same outfit every day i have if you if you were to come to my house it's it's comfort and efficiency over style and i yeah. think my entire life is that I, that's how we live too by the way i love it yeah yeah like I, I love, I appreciate beautiful things, but if I have to choose between beauty and comfort and efficiency, comfort and efficiency will win yeah. out. And a hoodie is the ultimate comfort and efficiency. It is. In my opinion. It is. I think it's also, I mean, I, I like, I know it sounds kind of funny, but I think that hoodies almost have this like layer of safety connected to them. I, I There's agree. something about the coziness of a hoodie that just like, yeah. They're one of my favorite things to wear as well. Yeah, they're so comfortable. Like totally, right? You can ignore the world if you want to, but you can be open if you want to. I mean, it's 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 this really beautiful thing. But um, I love that. So my question is, how many hoodies do you own? A lot. Uh, Like, do you even know the number? No, I don't, because I I always make them for the business, like for my for my private mastermind or for Funnel Gorgeous. So I have a ton of like Funnel Gorgeous Marketers Heart Digital Insiders hoodies. Then I have a massive love of Disney. So every time I go to Disney World, I get a Disney hoodie. And then, you know, I'm sure I have others from like other companies and stuff. So I have a lot. Yeah. I um, I can't tell you how many I've had over the years. I finally downsized and I think I'm less than 15 now. But it was because I had like a whole closet full of hoodies and it was like, okay, I'm not, I can't wear all of these. <laughs> and then I buy them for my, for, for my partner and then I steal them. And I'm like, here's a hoodie for you. Just kidding. I mean me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what's funny is we just went to um, we went to the Ed Sheeran concert not long ago. And my oh, wife nice. is like big into shows and big into merch at shows. And so when we went to see Ed Sheeran, it was kind of a clusterfuck because we went to Vegas. It got rescheduled literally like an hour and a half after we were on site. There was oh, like man. all this stuff that went down. But we had like two goals to there. It was like, OK, let's get water because it was hot on the day that we went. And let's make sure that we get to a, a merch tent. Well, I don't typically get merch at, at a lot of the places at the shows that we go to because I don't it doesn't like it doesn't move me, even though I like hoodies. But I love Ed Sheeran and I have a mad respect for the way he is as an artist and the way that he mm-hmm. collaborates and the way he moves to the world and the messages that he puts into the world. I just I'm, I'm a supporter. And so I was like, OK, I want a hoodie. And there was this really amazing hoodie. Well, my wife this time, I'm bigger than my wife. I wear sizes bigger than my wife. She ordered two of the same size. So that either one of us could wear them and she wouldn't have to worry about keeping track of whose hoodie was whose. And she's like, she's like, here's the thing. I'm probably just going to wear both of them more often. <laughs> more like, often, okay. yeah. It's like, I got you. So it's totally, totally real. Um, yeah. You know, you put something on your intake form that really jumped out at me. And I wanted to pause before we go further into some of your own stories. Uh, you know, you said you've got this weirdly vested interest in climate change. And yeah. I, I would really like to make zero assumptions about what that means to you i'd like it if you could just give us a little bit of a narrative around this weirdly vested interest in climate change what does it mean to you and what 
role, if any, have you played in helping impact it? Yeah. So this is a little bit of a psychological answer because I have lived my entire life, even pre all that that drama, I've lived with a chronic anxiety disorder Mm -hmm. that really um, showed up from my very, very youngest years, age four or five. I have core memories all the way through parenting. Mm -hmm. And so weirdly, when I focus my attention on problems that are so big and so out of my control, I get a weird sense of relief because mm. it makes my anxieties and problems seem smaller. Yeah. And so it's honestly partially a coping mechanism. And it's funny because people are like, I don't understand why studying something like climate change, which is terrifying for the entire planet, brings you relief. And I'm like, because it's it's like, well, then th- this problem over here doesn't really matter as right. much. And I can focus on the fact that I really want to take a cruise to Antarctica and see the penguins before all, you know, all the before ice they're all melts. gone. Yeah. 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 And that somehow reorients me and makes me feel more in the present moment. So that's, I think, where the interest came from. I am a very, very active as a consumer on Twitter X now. I don't post there very much. And so I'm always following scientists, wildlife, news, nature, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I I, I haven't really done much outside of just trying to distill large amounts of information into readable posts. And so I I have dabbled in writing newsletters for people who are interested, who don't want to study the science, but they just kind of want to know like Cliff Notes version. I have been very bad and very inconsistent about keeping up with it, but it's called the Dandelion Report. And that I, I stopped doing that about six months ago. It's still there. I will pick it you back up. You kind of had a lot of shit going on in 2023, just to give lot, you a little a grace. On, yeah, yeah. But that is kind of what, that that's like just a little outlet that I, I have. Actually, I mean, I, I, love, I love the intellectual answer. I mean, I think that that, I mean, it's very real. It's very raw. You are aware. You're conscious of what it is. You're using it as perspective. And you're also, whether you believe you're doing something active or not, distilling information down to a place that people can access it is one of the gifts that you have, right? Yeah. It's one of the skill sets. It's one something in your toolbox that you not only utilize in multiple facets of your life and businesses, but you have the ability to now do that even around something that's as large as climate change. Now, I want to be really clear. I don't talk about politics. Typically, I don't talk about religion. I don't get into those topics because typically they're just polarizing. However, yeah. I do find this this topic to be highly interesting because just objectively, right? I live in Phoenix, okay? What? We've had two summers in a row that we have set record temperature strings of days in a row. So multiple numbers of days over 110 degrees. Yes. And two years in a row, I want to say last year we broke the record. It was like 24 days. This I year remember. It was like, I was following it. <laughs> this year it was like 40, right? Yeah, it was a lot. And, and so, and I've been in Arizona, though I've moved around and lived in other places. I've been in Arizona a majority of my life. What? And all I can tell you is regardless of anybody else's opinion, objectively, it's getting hotter here, Yes. right? It's getting hotter to the place that it's noticeable and we're seeing those trends continue. And so through the lens of your aggregate amount of information distilled into Cliff's notes, what would be the you know one, two, or three bullet points around climate change that you think would be most relevant for people to understand? Sure. Well, one is a concept of overshoot, which is simply that we have exceeded the Earth's carrying capacity as humans, as a species. So if you look at this in, um, there, there was like a, a study of like an island where there were a bunch of soldiers and they put some deer there for them to hunt. Right. And then the soldiers left. And a year later, there was double. And then a year after that, there was whatever, 10x. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then the year after that, there was a drastic uh, population decrease because the deer had exceeded the carrying capacity of the ecosystem they were in. So the the biggest problem and the reason why everything's going to shit is really that we've just exceeded the earth's carrying yeah. capacity and we've artificially extended it by mining natural resources such as coal mm-hmm. and fossil fuels to extend the carrying capacity fertilizer is a huge one mm-hmm. right and so that's our problem it's not you know the yes the climate is going to go up and down but but because 
we are using so many resources mm -hmm. beyond what we can. The the Earth's ecosystem is straining under the weight of it. Yeah. And that is that is the big that is the big reason. There's a lot of other things going on that are a little bit more nitty gritty, but that's the that's the crux of the issue. Yeah. I, I mean, I even appreciate the terminology, carry capacity, right? I mean, I think that's, it's something that really grounds it. It does provide a slightly different perspective, even in just the way that we approach it. So thank you for going there. Yeah. You know, I referenced some of your skill sets, some of your toolbox, right? I mean, obviously we haven't gotten there yet. I'd like to shift there a little bit now, but sure. one of the things that, you know, you clearly are known for is being one of the top digital marketers that exist in the space and not just somebody who actively digital markets, but somebody who coaches others on how to use language positioning, marketing as an effective way for people to expand their reach, right? Mm -hmm. And truly grow their businesses as a result of utilizing communication, language, and structure as a result of it. Give us a little perspective as to why this path is the one that you chose originally and yeah. what about your life contributed to your desire to want to utilize writing, copy, and marketing to create impact? Yeah. So I went to school for clinical psychology. That's what my degree is of in. Of course you did. <laughs> yeah. So I see it. I love it. <laughs> so human behavior was always mm. fascinating to me. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's where I was going to go. Obviously, I graduated. I was young. I got pregnant. I got married. It was all I graduated uh, college five months pregnant with my first child. So I never went on to get my master's or anything. Yeah. And honestly, the most of it was sort of by accident because I was writing a blog once I had three children just for sanity's sake. And I was writing these silly little stories and all these people started following me. And then they were asking me questions about like how I made my blog look cool because I loved the like the tech. So I took a natural gift of writing and a natural just like love of tech. And that kind of blossomed into a tech blog business and then it blossomed into a website business and then once i had those skills then i kind of stumbled into marketing and i was like oh here's like the psychology side yeah. of it right and so that's where my interest came and so i blended all those things together and i built a marketing agency and i just i really thought that that was going to be what i was going to do is just yeah. write copy for people build funnels for people and then one day i was like maybe I should build one for myself, you know, because these people that I'm building funnels for are making a lot of money. And yeah, it's great that I'm getting paid $20,000 to, to build your, your funnel, but you're making a million dollars with exactly. that funnel. So yeah. maybe I should math this in my direction. So, and that's where I became more of a teacher and educator, but everything was, I mean, everything was driven by the desire, whether it was to, buy a house for my kids or do my college fund. Like it was all driven by just this need in my life. So it was more than just money that was driving me. Yeah. How have you been able to integrate psychology into your work? And yep. how large of a factor is that in what you're teaching others to utilize? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think one of the biggest things I can help people do is take away all the techno babble and help them get in the seat of like, if you have empathy, you can sit in the seat of your customer and you can mm -hmm. imagine how they're feeling sitting on their phone or sitting at their computer, reading your copy or stumbling upon your social media account. And the more that you can feel the pain, the mm -hmm. agitation of your customer, the more that you can get in their head, the more you can deliver content that's going to speak to them and help them. And so everything I do, you know, people like in digital marketing, for example, they're like, oh, study your avatar. And I'm like, no, let's just call it a human, okay? Like, who is your human? And what are they doing right now on a Saturday night at 7 p.m.? And that has been just humanizing a lot of the tactics mm -hmm. because everything about my business has grown Yes, I've learned tactics, but I've often done not what the tactic tells me to yeah. do, but it works anyway uh, because people crave human yeah. connection and yep. you really can't go wrong with that. 
Well, I really appreciate that. I mean, at least from my own perspective, I mean, I'm a human behavior and human connection expert. That's what I work on and I utilize right. it in our world. I couldn't agree with you more. And I also am the type that have often gone against what I've been told I exactly. should be doing, right? The yeah. tactics. And, and yet we still have success. And that doesn't mean that we figure it all out right away. But, you know, digital marketing has changed quite a lot. In, in particular, I'm going to say in the last 18 to 24 months, yes. right? I think we've seen a massive, massive shift. A lot of the world that didn't understand digital marketing, didn't know how to use it, didn't even know that it was an option, started leaning into it by mere necessity at the beginning of COVID because it was the only way to reach people for yep. lots of businesses. So what have been some of the biggest shifts that you've seen? And what do you believe are the greatest opportunities that exist for any business, regardless of size? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously so many shifts since COVID, there's a much more understanding of online online business since COVID, but that also means it's more crowded. Mm -hmm. And with TikTok and all the viral videos that go viral, there is, a attention is hard to get. And then this is like, if you are a good storyteller, if you're good at building intimacy and connection, you'll be okay. I think there is a, a whole sort of like 1.0 of the gurus that got really famous on sort of the old model yeah. that are falling now, either because they lost their hustle or because, you know, they just don't have the character to hold whatever yeah. success they had. Right. Cause it's, yeah. you can be on a pedestal for a little while, but then, you know, your skeletons start to show. Yeah. Um, so I think a lot of that has shifted obviously with AI there's a huge shift. Mm. Every, you know, the amount of AI tools and manufactured content. And so intimacy is going to be the premium in terms of being able to connect with your customers. And I, I watched a TEDx talk and they were talking about how social media, which was the first sort of AI, the algorithm, was really about the race to the bottom of the brain sets, brainstem mm. in terms of attention. Mm -hmm. And with AI... I mean, I don't really know what's going to happen to our brains. I'm a little afraid, to be quite honest, what's going to happen to our brains yeah. if AI removes our need to remember, removes our need to write, removes our need to do art. Like, what are we going to do? I'm not really yeah. sure. Um, but intimacy and connection are built into the human psyche. And while an AI can probably replicate that and will try, it's not going to be the same yeah. as human to human. Yeah, I completely agree. I also think it's interesting, though, because what AI has also done is caused more confusion for the consumer in the marketplace. For sure. Right? Because there are people who couldn't have ever communicated in a certain way, been able to articulate any kind of thought that now all of a sudden are phenomenal communicators in writing. <laughs> and and to the, the, the consumer who doesn't necessarily know, it's, I think, created more lack of trust. Right. Yep. I think we're seeing more and more of a desire for authentic leadership and like real mm -hmm. voices. And so I think it's what I think is interesting about AI. You know, it's it. I look at it like the Internet. I mean, look, we we had to remember when you and I were growing up. Right. It was rote memorization. Mm -hmm. Right. And in reality, we don't need to memorize anything anymore because we can get to anything right here on our phone within seconds. Right yeah. now, in one yeah. way, that's that's a gift and, and really something that we can utilize in another way it can seem scary and like a big concern. And so I, I'm, I'm with you. I don't know that I have concern about where we'll go with AI. I think what it does cause me to do is have a little bit more empathy for the real ones, Hello. right? Who are actually putting out real voices, real messages, real conversations and real connection into the world versus the systematized mass of AI utilization that's existing in the space today. Yeah. Right. I, I mean, it's it, it's it's interesting to me to just witness, but I really appreciate you kind of spending time even down that path and highlighting AI. I don't think it can ever give us empathy. I don't think it can ever give us emotion. I don't think it can ever give us some of the things that you intuitively can help people do by restructuring their words to be able to connect to an yeah. audience. Yeah. And so I, I really appreciate that. Now, you've been interviewed by some of the largest platforms on the planet for your expertise in digital media. I mean, you've been on Anderson Live, you've been on Rachel Ray, you've been on many, many, many platforms because whether you want to say it or not, like I said in the intro, you're a fucking badass <laughs> and you have credibility and you have heart and to everything you just communicated, you have the ability to create intimacy and connection real time in any conversation. I've witnessed it, I've been a part of it. And so what I'm curious about is 
based on some of the platforms that you have been on, what have been some of the greatest lessons you've extracted as a result of those interviews and the way they were navigated or which questions were asked? You know, some of the um, interviews that are most poignant are not the biggest ones. I believe right? that, the by big- the way. I believe yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. I And also, just like a little hot tip, if you're a business owner and you're looking for people to promote you, it's always the little guys with a little bit more grit that are going to do a better job mm. than, the, than the big names. Bingo. I... I'm always surprised. So like I had an article written in uh, Mother Working Mother Magazine and Forbes specifically around my first divorce and the fact that I temporarily had to stop being the primary custody parent so that I could get back on my feet. And it's funny because when you tell a story, you have your perspective, but then the media will like, Mm. you know strip it of all its nuance yeah to serve it up to the general population and <laughs> so i have even though that's it's a very personal story and it's a hard story it causes a tremendous amount of pain to this day in fact it's gotten more painful the further out i've gone i find that some of those interviews while they were good for credibility they just lose the nuance and it's these yeah. kinds of podcasts and conversations where i feel like that nuance is mm-hmm. preserved and so i'm less interested in the big things these days than i am the more intimate conversations because of that i'm really grateful that you started with the way you did and how you took the answer in that entire question i was hoping that you would go there and I, I had no idea, but I had a little bit of an intuition that that might be the direction you'd go. And, and I just want to reinforce and double down on what you just said, because, you know, that is something that, that we often are trying to help people understand and separate in is that it's like, yeah, you can chase the whale of the platform, but yeah. you also have even less control of the message and the nuance in the message and how it's going to be delivered. And so the size of the platform doesn't matter as much as the impact of the platform based on its accuracy and congruence with you. And so I'm really grateful that you took it there. Um, yeah. I know we're going to be wrapping up our interview here relatively quickly, but I, I did want to ask, what would you say is your biggest problem in life or business right now? <laughs> uh, I mean, outside of not having enough time, which I feel like is that's everybody's answer, <laughs> right? My problem is I don't have enough time. I, honestly, someone asked me the other day, what's your word of the year? And it just like, I hadn't thought of it. And I just, I just sputtered out, relax. Seriously, I think the number one thing that I need to focus on is making sure I can regulate my nervous system because yeah. there's so many people depending on me to stay sane. And I've seen a lot of people that have gone, you know, like they've mm-hmm. had like a like a break, like a mental break um, and really lost their mental faculties yeah. under the pressure. So that is my number one priority problem is like in, in my life these days. You know, and it's a full circle conversation, right? I mean, that was <laughs> kind of even the beginning of where we started to talk about certain things. And, you know, I, yeah. I, I, I couldn't agree more, by the way. I do still believe that nervous system regulation is one of the greatest investments that any entrepreneur can make. It's yep. something that I can tell you firsthand has changed my life, but it's also something that we integrate completely into like our transformational retreats because sometimes people need the physical experience and the real time result to understand what its impact can be. Yeah. Um, I love that relax is your word for the year. I love that your focus on your nervous system is is right there because it, it is the least selfish thing you can do, right? Yeah. It really is because it's what's going to give you the capacity, the wherewithal, the emotion, the all of it to be able to continue to support all the lives that you do. Uh, I'm grateful for how vulnerable you were with our conversation. I'd love it if you could tell us and our audience, where can people find you? Where can they follow you? How can they engage with all of your brilliance? Yeah, so the easiest place to go is just my website, juliechanel.com, C-H-E-N-E-L-L.com. I have blog posts, I have some free offers, and if you want to reach out to me, you can do so right on my website. I would love it also if you could leave us with a closing thought. A closing thought. Well, I, I would say that all of us are in pursuit of more freedom, more success. I would really encourage people to take stock in what their core values are 
and structure their life in such a way that those values remain priority. Most of you will find that money is not as high up on the list as you think it is. It's just that because it feels scarce, sometimes it feels like the most important. And I promise you, the more distance you have from some of the things you're facing right now, the more perspective you'll have. And so I, I've just learned this the hard way that like, if I don't keep my core values front and center, they will be taken because mm-hmm. I am the protector of the things that matter Bingo. most to me. Bingo. And so that would be my advice. Well, I think it's beautifully said. Thank you so much for being with us, my friend. Yeah. Thank you for having me. And for those of you who watched Julie jump in, I told you she was real. She was raw. Her heart is real. It's palpable. She gave us real time perspective on some of the challenges that have taken place in the most recent 12 months. Things that have caused and triggered trash from her past that she's continued to trip over and only got reinforced because someone did something malicious and that creates damage. Yet she puts herself in a position to continue to repair and grow. And she's also very, very clear at this moment that she has to relax. She has to regulate her nervous system. And that's what's going to open her up for everything she desires in her life. Same opportunity is available for you, but it's going to require you to flip open your lid and scan your camp. What you can probably tell by now is that I love telling these stories, but what I love even more is the impact that's coming from them. You see, we're on a mission to impact over a billion lives as quickly as possible, but to do that, we need you. See, we believe that moved people move people. And so all I'm asking is if you've resonated, connected with any of the messaging, please consider like, commenting, sharing, leave a rating and review. Thank you so much for tuning into Flipping the Lid. And if you want more information on the show, how to become a guest, how to recommend a guest, or any of the other details, head over to flippinthelid.com.